Good afternoon. I want to go ahead and get started because we've got a very full program this afternoon and evening. And I want to start by welcoming you here um, today and asking a question. How many of you were aware that Punjabi is the third most spoken language in California? Okay. A decent number, actually. Well, I'm hoping that we'll all learn a lot more than that uh, in this evening. So welcome to this Public History Institute program, which I think is a long overdue opportunity to focus our attention on a community with a rich history, culture, and religion, which the Public History Institute is excited to explore with you today. I'm Miriam Robb, Vivian Director of the Public History Institute at CSUB, and this program on our sick community would not have been possible without the work of members of the Public History Institute Committee, and I know several of you are here today. Would you stand up, please, if you're a member? Donato's already standing, so we can't really do that. Please allow me a few other expressions of gratitude to the Walter Stern Library and Dean Sandra Bozarth for allowing us to use this beautiful space. To Amanda Meanley, Administrative Support Coordinator for the Library Dean. To Frank Aguirre for being our sound technician kind of behind the curtain here, but doing important work for us. To Charlotte Ziegler, History Department Assistant who created our flyer and provided other assistance, including finishing proctoring my Roman history midterm so I could get over here early. <laughs> to Donato Cruz for providing so much technological help, including the slideshow at the back of the room there, and for recording this evening's program. To Chris Livingston, university archivist, library liaison for the PHI, and a member of the SICK program subcommittee with Donato and Monique Dollywall, whom I want to thank for her insights and the cultural items on display in the back of the room. To my department colleagues for their support of the PHI's work, notably department chair Doug Dodd, whose wordsmithing always gets us a solid title. To Raji Korabrar, who helped us confirm a date for this program, functioned as, it was a little tricky, but we did, um, functioned as a liaison for a good portion of the panel. I would also be remiss if I didn't recognize the help of Andrea Weichel in the Dean's Office of the College of Arts and Humanities, who directed us to an alternative funding source after budget cuts left us without any funding for PHI programming this academic year. That funding has come just lately from extended university and global outreach. And I and the PHI committee deeply appreciate their help with programming expenses. As I think this all makes clear, programs such as this don't happen without funding and a lot of hands sharing the work, which makes me particularly grateful that so many others have shared my desire to offer this program today. I'd like to add that a compliment to this program will take place right here tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. about the redistricting in Bakersfield that provides better representation to the sick community. Fair lines make fair lives. So, uh, we're going to have next a brief excerpt, 12 plus minutes, of a film from 1998, a documentary called Roots in the Sand. And its focus is mainly on um, sick men who came to California in the late 19th century uh, and following from that point on. And some ended up in the Imperial Valley and married Mexican, Mexican farm women. It's a fascinating story. And though we'll just see a little bit of it, I really hope it'll pique your interest enough to um, take a look at it if you're a registered student or faculty staff who have access to library holdings. You can, uh, you can view that film in its entirety sometime between now and through 2025 when our lease expires. Okay, so, roots in the sand. 
played out in different ways throughout California, and particularly in the Central Valley. To give us a bit more history, uh, going back some 500 years, we'll talk about their um, history and religion and migration to California. And we have Dr. Shahir Afaki. Oops. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. I don't really need to repeat all that, do I? Okay, great. Okay. Uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Shafi, uh, Shahir Afaki, who joined the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies in fall 2022 after earning his PhD at Indiana University in Bloomington. His expertise is Islamic thought and culture, particularly medieval and modern religious ideas and practices in South and West Asia. He's also very interested in interreligious relations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Afaki, whose presentation is titled From Punjab to California, Sikhism's Formative History and Transnational Growth. <laughs> Uh, which engaged in a world-renouncing 
form of spirituality. So various Hindu ascetics in particular would completely withdraw from society uh, to discipline their body and they would completely renounce the world. However, Guru Nanak Dev Ji emphasized that spiritual growth does not come through physical withdrawal from society but through active engagement with the world. And we find uh, several beautiful paintings from the Sikh tradition where Guru Nanak is engaging in a debate with Hindu ascetics on this theme and uh, teaching them about his vision. So he advocated maintaining spiritual discipline amidst family, work and community, uh, rejecting what he saw as the extremes of world renouncing asceticism. He saw it as escapism, as ineffective for fostering genuine inner spiritual realization. And it was this creative synthesis of a world embracing theology and an inner worldly asceticism that is being in the world but not of the world that offered the Punjabis of his time a refreshing and accessible form of spirituality. Guru Nanak's teachings appealed to many within Hindu and Muslim communities during his lifetime and after his era in subsequent centuries as well. Sikhism not only experienced tremendous growth in Punjab during subsequent centuries, but key Sikh figures also went on to contribute to governance in the region in an attempt to actualize the teachings of Guru Nanak. The most notable figure in this regard is Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who is remembered as embodying Guru Nanak's ideals of inclusivity, justice, and fair governance. And here it's important to remember uh, that not only Sikhs, but many Hindus and Muslims also remember his era as one of compassionate rule. So even when we reflect on the contributions of the Sikh diaspora across the world and specifically in Bakersfield and California, it's, um, it's, it's important to remember the impact of the teachings of Guru Nanak uh, in contributing to a world-centered and a service-centered theology. But to return to our narrative, by the onset of the 19th century, uh, Sikhism is flourishing in Punjab. It is also important to recognize that Sikh identity was intimately tied at this point to Punjabi, that is being Punjabi. At a basic level, uh, of course, most Sikhs, like most Punjabis, were an agrarian community. They were farmers and landowners. But even more crucially, Punjab has been the sacred space of Sikhism, with hundreds of sacred sites. So the notion of leaving Punjab, even at this point in the 19th century, uh, would not have been a pleasant one for most Sikhs, as well as other Punjabis. And yet, by the end of the 19th century, some Sikhs sought to build their lives in distant lands, as you just saw in the documentary. So what happened? Well, as with most of the problems in the 19th century, it had to do with British colonialism. Um, by the turn, uh, by, by the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the British East India Company had occupied much of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, the Sikh Kingdom of the Punjab was one of the final areas to be annexed. And with the occupation of the Punjab, um, the era of economic and cultural prosperity in, in Punjab that existed during the Sikh kingdom uh, came to an end. Specifically, uh, British land revenue and taxation policies uh, made farming an unsustainable uh, mode of livelihood uh, in Punjab for most Punjabis, including Sikhs. And so it is due it is in response to the policies of British colonialism uh, that 
you find the first wave of Sikh migration. And so the farmers who came to California, uh, that you just saw in the documentary as well, they, uh, they will no longer uh, afford to remain farmers in the Indian subcontinent. So they came all the way over to California and uh, they had many stops across the way as well uh, to search for that connection again. So the first wave of Sikh emigration starts in the late 19th century, continues to uh, the early 20th century. Uh, but at this point, uh, there are only a few um, Sikh establishments in North America and particularly in California. Uh, there are many hurdles in this process. The next systematic wave of immigration follows uh, the partition of the Indian subcontinent uh, in 1947. So uh, the history of the partition of the Indian subcontinent is very complicated. Um, uh, it, <laughs> rather than delving into it uh, too deeply, I will explain it at uh, a fundamental level. In 1947, uh, the region was partitioned into two new states, India and Pakistan. Uh, it's crucial to note that in this period, the united homeland of the Sikhs, the Punjab, was now also partitioned between these two states. So West Punjab, which you see in, in green there, ends up going to Pakistan. And Eastern Punjab, which, uh, which you find in red and yellow in this map, uh, goes to India. Uh, with the onset of partition, uh, thousands of Sikhs lose access to their ancestral land, uh, but there is also a sense of spiritual dislocation that comes with partition. To give you a sense of that, let's return to this image here of Kartarpur Sahib. Uh, so this is one of the most uh, sacred sites in Sikhism. In 1947, after the border, uh, borders were drawn between India and Pakistan, uh, you now had a situation where Kartarpur Sahib was placed on the Pakistani side, just a few miles inside the Pakistani border. Uh, more Sikhs were now concentrated on the Indian side of Punjab. And uh, getting the visa to travel from India to Pakistan, these two uh, hostile countries at the time, was not easy. So Sikhs could view the Kartarpur Sahib from the Indian side, uh, but uh, could not directly travel to it. So what would they do? Uh, they would use binoculars, here you see them uh, lining up, to uh, have a darshan, to try to experience the spiritual presence of Guru Nanak uh, through binoculars. And it wasn't until uh, 2019 that the states of India and Pakistan opened uh, a corridor called the Kartarpur Corridor that then allowed visa-free access for Sikh pilgrims across the world. Uh, so there was a sense of spiritual dislocation that came with partition. But to return to the economic aspect again, uh, remember Sikhs are an agrarian community even at this point in time. And many of them have left their lands in Pakistan as they migrate to India. In this context, we start to witness the second wave of Sikh migration. Um, the two states of India and Pakistan would take decades in any case to recover from the trauma of partition, uh, the economic problems that emerged with it. This wasn't just specific to Sikhism, but uh, for all communities. And so you now have a new wave we find the second wave of South Asian immigrants, including Sikhs, who search for new ways of uh, forming a livelihood in uh, North America, particularly uh, the US and Canada. During this time, uh, the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act fosters uh, migration from South Asians 
uh, because it specifically now invites skilled professionals, highly skilled professionals, to come to the US and contribute to various fields. So in the first wave, you mostly had uh, very hardworking farmers. In the second wave, uh, which follows 1947, you now have uh, seed doctors, engineers, uh, people who are interested in business moving to the US during this time. And uh, uh, they are facilitated by the 1965 Immigration Act. More specifically, they are now also allowed to bring their family members from the Punjab uh, to California. So my immigration becomes a little easier. It's never easy. And I won't get into that. In any case, uh, so we now have the second wave of migration. So the first wave, just to recall, is late 19th century uh, to the early 20th century. The second wave specifically starts, I would say, 1947. And I've set 1984 as the cutoff point uh, because meanwhile, events in the Indian subcontinent uh, were not going so well either. So, here it's important to mention that after partition, most factions within Sikhism migrated to India in the hope that their interests would be better protected in a secular India. India defined itself as a secular state. However, over subsequent decades following 1947, tensions grew between some factions of Sikhism and the government of India particularly around demands for greater autonomy in Punjab and the protection of Sikh religious and political rights. These issues escalated in the 1980s, culminating in Operation Blue Star. So, in 1984, you have Operation Blue Star, where the Indian Army storms the Golden Temple, a, a sacred Sikh site in Amritsar, in an attempt to drive out what it called Sikh separatists and militants. Uh, most Sikhs uh, obviously saw this as a desecration uh, of one of their holiest sites. Uh, the event killed hundreds of innocent Sikhs as well. And after this desecration, the aftermath saw the assassination of the Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, by her Sikh bodyguards, which was then followed by violent anti-Sikh massacres by Hindu nationalists, which resulted in thousands of deaths. So, um, in a span of few days, uh, thousands of Sikhs are completely uh, massacred in uh, particularly in New Delhi, uh, but in other parts of northern India as well. And there are different figures for this. Uh, the Indian government puts it around 3,300, but independent sources uh, and Sikh sources emphasize that it goes up to 30,000. So it's a very traumatic uh, series of events in the 1980s. And so, the 1984 operations, as well as the aftermath of that, deepens the Sikh community's sense of alienation and trauma, uh, and their hopes, for many of them, their hopes of uh, experiencing a kind of a stable life uh, in post-partition India were dashed. And so it is after 1984 that we find and we experience the third wave of Sikh migration. Uh, this wave of migration, while it still overlapped with earlier waves in that there were, of course, economic immigrants, uh, but there were many uh, figures who were simply experiencing political persecution within India at the time. And so they sought to flee the political instability. Uh, the political instability and persecution fueled a wave of immigration with many seeking safety and a chance to rebuild their lives away from the violence and oppression faced in India. And uh, while the political structure of the Indian government and the party that's currently in power obviously has changed since then, the political component of migration continues uh, to be in place today as well. 
with the rise of Hindu nationalism in India uh, in recent decades, there is a concern amongst minorities across the region and specifically within India, including Christians, Muslims and Sikhs uh, about their future. And so political asylum seekers continue to come to the US and specifically to New York and California in this regard. Post 1984, you also have the development of more politically active Gurdwaras uh, in California and in New York. So, I do want to emphasize not all Gurdwaras are, say, pro Khalistan. Obviously, Sikhs are not a monolith, uh, but some uh, would emphasize the need for an independent homeland. Even uh, this year as well, for instance, there was a referendum earlier on this topic. So uh, the Khalistan issue also continues to be a subject of concern amongst the Sikhs uh, of California and beyond, obviously, in uh, North America. So, uh, so we've talked about three waves of migration, and uh, we have uh, uh, talked about the origins of Sikhism as well. And I'm, I'm at the mark. Uh, so. Uh, I'll just end with this quote uh, from a prominent scholar of Sikhism. While there is little consensus with regard to actual numbers, it can safely be said that of the 23 million Sikhs, between 1 and 1.5 million live outside India. The Sikh diaspora represents an important component of Indian migration in that Sikhs constitute a disproportionately high percentage of Indian immigrants worldwide. This is striking in light of Sikhs making up less than 2% of the total Indian population. A popular saying among Sikhs notes that each time a Sikh leaves the homeland, it is simply a return to what is most permanent, the journey. Underscoring both the pain of separation from the homeland and the sense of adventure that has long characterized the community. And so I think we can now turn to hearing about the sense of adventure. Thank you. Sick American History from UC Riverside last spring. 
that my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation created at, uh, at that level, um, at, at the Gurdwara level, where they created uh, our own institutions. Um, and I was able to take part in those institutions because of the importance that my parents' and grandparents' generation placed on having uh, what is called like the having a Nishan side to plant, having a, a mark and laying, laying a landmark in our community uh, to signify that we're here. And those community centers first started in YMCA's and, and developed later where the community was able to build capital and purchase uh, older buildings and, and begin to practice there and the community gathered there uh, and eventually being able to build our own institutions as well so uh, and my story starts there as well uh, my parents would volunteer their time within the Khalsa schools or the Punjabi schools and it's also the reason I'm, I'm able to read and write good Rukhi or Punjabi today is uh, a lot of uh, not so fun evenings were spent <laughs> when everyone else is playing outside and uh, you have to learn to read and write which I uh, thank my elders tenfold for, uh, for emphasizing that but I would say my identity is forged by, by those local roots uh, that we continue to grow out, but um, I'll, I'll pass it down the line so I don't take up too much time here. Um, so I would say my um, journey is interesting. Um, as a kid, like I went to the Gwadara like every Sunday and then I would go to school every Sunday as well. Um, but I grew up in a very interesting household. I uh, lived in a joint household with my uncle, my master and my mom. So my master is actually atheist, and so is my cousin. And so I grew up in that kind of mindset. So Sikhi was important, and I definitely do take um, most of the Sikhi through all my life. But I grew up with such a diverse way of thinking, so it's not my only So that's how I kind of grew up. So I'm, I'm teaching myself again to be rooted with my community again. How about this? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I want to thank President Bernard Harper for being here today. Thank you for being here. Um, and I want to thank CSUV's Department of History. Uh, I went to Cal State, and I could have never imagined having an event like this, with sitting up here with folks just talking about my community, my faith, and how I grew up. So. Um, I feel so seen right now, so I want to say thank you so much, Cal State. This means a lot to me. <laughs> My journey as a Sikh in the Central Valley, I really relate to the movie of uh, Roots in the Sand because we are here because of chain migration through my mom's uncle, who was one of the originals that came in 1900, the same story you heard. Um, but instead of the Imperial Valley, my mom's family started farming in the San Joaquin, Fresno County. Same, same story, but in Fresno County. So very relatable, grew up in the farm labor camps with everybody, uh, with Hispanic families, and then eventually moved to Bakersfield when I was 11 or 12 years old and grew up here as well. But I guess it was also a bit triggering watching the, the movie and then also listening to the professor t speak about our faith and what happened and why we had to come to America and hearing how we were kind of forced from our homeland. So I will say I did feel a lot of emotions listening to our history, but, and hearing the word Hindu, so I want to share that, I was mentioning to Manpri. Growing up, we were called Hindus as a racial slur because nobody knew what Sikhs were, but I remember the kids would say like, Hindu, 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 that's what they would call us. And um, to fast forward to today, to be sitting here and talking about Sikhs and learning about Sikhs is so crucial and so important to understand and get the history correct. And that's ultimately the point when you respect somebody and you see them as a person, because everybody wants to be seen, right? Do you see me? And to be here today and talk about the roots of our history, where Sikhism began, why we came to America, you know, to, to talk about colonialism and the effects that it has on so many different people. And so for me, my relationship with the Central Valley um, is all I know. Born and raised here, I love it. Um, but I'm very happy to see where it's going. So I would say my relationship is getting better with the Central Valley. <laughs> My 
Marx with Big City in Central Valley is very similar to what Mod Bridge is sharing. Um, it's about community, um, mainly our institution, the Gurdwara. Um, I was, it was really what kept me grounded in the faith and in community, Sangat, um, everything I've learned, um, the language, learned the history of the Sikh community. I'm from um, Stockton, California, um, not local. So, um, and thank you, Raji, for inviting me um, to come out. And Stockton is the oldest Sikh institution in the United States. So for me, growing up in Stockton and listening to the elders in the Gurdwara talking about the history of the community and talking about their struggles and everything that they fought for, um, it's really what kept me grounded. Uh, so for me, it's the Gurdwara is the institution for Sikhs. And you know, also being a first generation, it's, it's also a, it's a little bit of a complicated history at the same time because um, and I know this is a little bit into the second question, but it's also about my experience um, being a Sikh in Central Valley is, you know, being a turban wing individual in post 9-11 America. Um, I mean, I was in first grade when 9-11 happened, so I don't really recall um, many memories, but again, the, the name calling, the bullying, um, I got into many fights um, throughout um, K-8 through high school, um, stopped once I, got out of high school um, and learn a different way to tackle those issues. But it's something that is very interesting because Stockton has a hundred plus year history of six being, um, and not just Stockton, California has a hundred plus year history of six being here, yet it's amazing to me that many people here still aren't aware of that history and aren't aware of who six are. So I still find myself um, trying to address that issue, and it's the reason why I decided to pursue a, a field in you know preserving Sikh American history and really um, highlighting this history for the public. Uh, 
um, being in an elected office, if it weren't for, for people who really laid the foundation um, of the institutions, of the programs, of the spaces, and the places uh, that allow for me to come forward as well. And um, I, I want to create space for uh, recognizing those people that um, in my own journey of learning about my sick identity, while there are uh, tons of challenges, I also, I think I uh, am inspired by those who took those challenges as opportunities to build power in our community um, and within our community across California to really build this Sikh Punjabi legacy within California. And some of those include uh, Deja Singh, Professor Deja Singh, who was um, attended UC Berkeley, uh, helped build the Stockton Gurdwara, and uh, was probably one of the first six to attend that institution. We have some bears in the room. I know you guys are filled with pride right now. Uh, you know, it was folks like Jaswant Singh Kalara who did research um, and documented the political atrocities that happened in Punjab for generations like my father's generations to come and seek political refuge in places like Bakersfield. It's the Gujarat Dinlons of our community and, and Mrs. Dinlon who built uh, foundational institutions within our community uh, that allowed for a person like me to go to the Gurdwara and have a place of belonging. It's the late Majid Singh Sidhu who was the architect of the first Gurdwara we built from the ground up as a community in the city of Bakersfield. Uh, before that, we had uh, different buildings that were purchased, uh, but he designed the first building and, and gave us that landmark locally uh, within Bakersfield. Uh, and his daughter Mona is with us here today. Thank you, Mona, for making time for, to come. Uh, but it's also all of the, the collective um, of nameless folks who continue the seva within our gurdwara, the women, uh, so many countless women. And I think back to my own childhood of those who uh, created nurture and love so that the challenges we faced every day at school, being some of the only six, being some of the only Punjabis in class, felt a little less heavy when you would go to the Gurdwara on Sunday and you would see uh, Garibalankiji creating, making Pagorda for us on Sunday and she was, she is and has always been known to have the best Pagorda, which is a dish in uh, one of our Punjabi dishes. Uh, like if you had a program at the Gurdwara, you invited her because she was, she knew what was going to be on the menu and she was going to make it the best and that is our hyper-local experience growing up, but that was that sense of belonging. It's going to the world on a Sunday and, um, and, and eating those foods and seeing young people your age and, and talking about these different things, but also not talking about that at all, like going in the back and playing basketball. Girls weren't allowed to do that, but uh, that's my own. Um, that's my own uh, grudge. But uh, those, were the, and those were the people that um, sowed so much love into our community, our upbringing, and I don't even think they realize the impact that they had and, and kind of the ripple effect that it's had uh, for us to today feel belonging in a room like today. So um, I, I want to I give room and space to the challenges, but that's trauma I want to also leave behind uh, and make room for the people that allow for us to uh, help those challenges feel smaller. Sí. 
books around me. It was, uh, you know, I was born in 1975, you can do the math. Um, but, so I constantly balanced being American and sick. That was a thing. And I will be, I can honestly say as a 40, now eight year old woman that, yeah, I was embarrassed of my culture because I wanted to fit in with everybody in the school. And I, I've had so many just embarrassing stories and mortifications of like not being able to fit in. I wanted to be like everybody else. And I think as young people, that's very natural. So I struggled a lot with my identity growing up. And um, even in high school, struggled. I will say in college is when I began to embrace my Sikh identity. And um, if you would have told me when I was in high school that I'd be sitting up here talking about my Sikh identity, I would have never believed you. Um, but that's a part of the journey. And I give credit to these actually younger generation who I'm so proud of because they've embraced their identity through associations like the Jakarta movement, through our good body. Thank you, uh, Uncle Delon, for establishing those and having this younger generation being so proud of their culture, which I love right now. I see in all different cultures that people are embracing their roots and where they come from. And so my inner child gets healed by through them and watching them, what they're doing. And um, now my son is sitting here today uh, and he's watching this. And his school has a Sikh service and honor society thanks to the Jagada movement that Manu started here in Kern County. So he has a group where he can feel comfortable and have somebody who looks like him work. I didn't. So for me, uh, the relationship is ever changing, but it feels so good that I can talk about openly uh, the insecurities I felt and as a young person with my identity. But yes to everything everybody else says, I will say politically, the Sikh community got involved after 9-11 because we had no choice. Um, we were being attacked and we were very scared and worried and we had to reach out to our electeds and our sheriff. And, and I think that mobilized us to say, whoa, we just can't keep our head down and work hard and that's all we're here for. So I will definitely say, even though it was very traumatic, but it did get us to lift our head up and get involved. So that's a little bit of my complicated journey. <laughs>
it takes challenging those notions as well because our religion is one that advocates for women first. You know, we learned about Gunanik Saiji a little bit today, who is the founder of the Sikh faith tradition, and uh, you know, his writings tell us, you know, why I call her bad from her kings are born. And this is a very popularized quote, very popular quote that um, is often that Gunanik Saiji is identified as you know, one of the first feminists. And uh, these are kind of ways in which they are described. So our religion elevates women uh, because in a kind of a socio-political um, time period and geographically in a region where, you know, Gunanik Saiji was looking around and probably thinking, this is absolutely incorrect, but it actually, he credits a lot of his empowerment and centering women to his sister, Bibi Nanki. And um, while his father, Nanak Saibji's father, was not crazy about their ideas in, um, in economic equality, in social equality, in political equality, uh, it was his father who actually came from a kind of well-to-do family wanted his son to kind of follow the same path. You know, they were the equivalent of like business owners. Like, why wouldn't you want to be economically sound how we are? Why are you giving all of your, why are you giving all of your allowance away on your walk to the store? Um, and his father actually kicked him out in a sense, and he went and could not accept he went and lived with his sister who was already married off, and that was also very non-traditional. Um, in that time period for someone's sister to come live with them while they're living with their in-law family. But in such a unique circumstance, it was a sister who, it was their sister who empowered them to such an extent. Um, and I think that just goes to show that in our, at our very roots, at our very roots, that, that is the same empowerment that I at least seek to channel. And I see women around me, women's generation, generations before me, and we just continue to kind of chip away at some of these Socio-cultural things that I think are just unique to the South, like the South Asian culture at large. When I say it's just our culture, or our religion um, at all. It's not our religion at all. It is, I would say, more cultural. Um, but those are the same inequalities that we see manifest in different ways, even in the United States, um, when you take different rights that are um, women's rights uh, or any marginalized communities. Um, so I think some examples uh, were just. You know, sometimes I'll be in spaces, in community spaces, and I, I look around and I'm often the only woman, <laughs> the youngest woman, um, but it did take women of the generation before me being just as adamant to take up space that I now have the room to just squeeze on by, squeeze into the room and be there and be present to make sure that the women who follow, there's three to four that, that follow behind me as well. So um, we continue to challenge it, but I think there's, um, I'm inspired by my own kind of Sikh faith tradition roots um, that have always empowered women. It was women who built the institution of Lanka, which Sikhs are, I think our Sikh faith and our Sikh community are often popularized by uh, you know the free meals that are available at our Gurdwara or places of worship, or, or this is the generosity of the Sikh community, but it was actually not that he be a woman who institutionalized that. Um, so it's women who also have built in and built in that nurture, that love, that strength, that resilience. Um, and I, I hold on to those examples as well um, to, to kind of keep me moving forward. So thank you. I definitely have used Guru Nanak's line for sure to like, um, like in my family especially, uh, being, like, being a sick woman, uh, we actually had a lot of equality. So it was it was most of the Punjabi culture that kind of made it a struggle for me where I was like, I'm gonna do this too, and we're like, it's lenient on boys, which frustrated me so much. <laughs> but I'm the type of person who doesn't take anything from anyone, and my mom knows that for a fact. Um, so I changed that. Um, I probably don't touch chores as much as my brother does now. My brother my dad cooks and cleans and everything, so I make sure of that and I advocate for that a lot. So I use Guru Nanak's line so much. When anyone has anything to say in my culture, I'm like, this is not what we believe in. This is Sikhi. Sikhi was all about feminism. He was a much feminist culture. So yeah, 
power of non-faith. That's the way we are doing it. So this is just such a powerful moment. It really does my heart good to see you all on stage talking about your faith um, and feeling that sense of belonging that you spoke to. Um, coming from a different marginalized group here in the U.S. and here in Kern County, um, my question is always the same. How can we support um, the strengthening and the furtherance of that sense of belonging for all people, but especially the Sikh community here? I think the biggest thing is solidarity, right? Um, understanding the common struggles and understanding the differences. Um, when, I mean, one of the first things is the fact that you showed up today, right? You showed up to learn and educate yourself more about the Sikh community um, and what the Sikh community is about. So, I mean, I think that's a start, is educating yourself about the struggles of different communities, the Sikh community, um, and then learn, hearing from them, um, learning, to, learning from them about what can, you do as an ally to support your sick brothers and sisters. This question, uh, I should probably address it to Monique because you're a history major, but do you know whether the history, social science framework for teaching public schools in California uh, has representation of the same experience. I'll say this, my brother said this to me, when we're kids and we're learning about religion, um, or any history, it's, we have just one part to talk about sick and it was just golden and gold, that's it. Um, so I would hope like in the future or now, we start teaching Pujabi in schools, Punjabi is like now the third most spoken language and I would teach about culture and Sikhi as well. I think it would just start from their classes, just slowly starting would be start teaching the language and maybe doing an intro class um, about Sikhi, especially in Vegas, or at least local history especially. And I hope Monique can build some of the infrastructure for us to build on um, teaching the Sikh faith tradition in public schools. I have two examples to share on this note. Um, it, through kind of our advocacy work in the past, um, including in, in the Jagada movement, uh, we were trying to add um, some more elements of more sick curriculum to uh, the, you know, the public school system curriculum at, at a state level. Um, and unfortunately, we faced a lot of roadblocks in that uh, because of, you know, some of the history that you've learned, some of the challenges, there's certain, um, extremely orthodox or, or nationalistic uh, activism uh, that prevents uh, the Sikh history to be told from an authentic, factual point of view and seeks to dilute that history and that existence. Um, so there's still work to do there, but there's, there's powers that be that prevent that uh, kind of within our education system, within the political system. Um, and, and that really falls into like the Sikhs' right to exist as well and why a lot of our community has settled to be political refugees here today. And the second note is um, we have brought Punjabi programs to teach the language to different high schools within uh, the state of California. Um, the Bay Area is a great example. They've had programs for a long time in San Jose, uh, in places like Fremont, uh, actually in the city of Fresno. I have one of my former colleagues, Gumbaljit Gore, at the back of the room. Uh, they were very active in um, mobilizing the community in Fresno so that in the Central Unified School District, the Punjabi uh, language course could be taken just as French, German, um, Spanish is learned now, Punjabi is there. And also locally uh, at Ridgeview High School, we have we advocated and were able to successfully get a program approved, but uh, are still seeking the, the teacher that qualifies for to teach that program so that it sustains itself and lives beyond, uh, you know, however uh, you can be relevant and interesting to a high schooler. I think that's the challenge. Uh, but it's also a, an access challenge. We still need to build some capacity to be able to 
create credential programs um, within kind of collegiate, at, at the collegiate level. So, you know, I don't know if there's like a trustee on this panel, like, <laughs> I just want to add um, also two quick notes. One thing that one read that said was, you know, how is that be to ensure that six are included or six struggles that Sikh history is not mentioned? Um, one example is, I don't know the exact year, but over a decade ago, the Hindu American Foundation uh, went to the California uh, Board of Education and was trying to argue that six are Hindus and, you know, just teach all students in California that six are Hindus. Um, again, the Sikh community fought against that, but then, is those types of struggles. And then the second note was also due to um, Jakarta Movement's advocacy. There was work to get Sikh American history included in the ethnic studies curriculum that was recently made, mandated by the state of California. And even at the personal level, there's a work that we're doing in certain districts. And this is one of the reasons why I actually wanted to come here and I wanted to just be the other one that I didn't want to be a peer. Um, I was to come to see what the work that's being done in Bakersfield and I do appreciate that I saw that the Public History Institute has a tab on their website about the history of six in the California and it also localizes it and talks about that history of the first Punjabi school starting in the 1990s which I really appreciate because that's a lot more than many other institutions have in, throughout California so I think it's amazing um, but just localizing that history and making sure that we can work at that grassroots level to ensure it's being taught at you know districts in Bakersfield or at the collegiate level. And I'm glad to hear that there's something in the works from the trustee, so. <laughs> okay, one more because I'm really excited about this. Um, Dr. We've talked about a lot of the struggles in Sikhi, and especially being a Sikh like, American in a way. But over like the past 20 years, the biggest one has been crazy and it's like something we've given. So would you say that struggle has kind of decreased and the perception has changed? Because I've noticed, especially like nowadays, like when I was a kid, it was like it was crazy, man. Like Batum does, it was like a lot. But now it's just like it's kind of relaxed. Like a little brother wears his Buddha. And he's like never been like really like he doesn't have a struggle about it too, he's just a normal kid, like, five a day. We had that whole, like, who are we, you know, like, like, we always got picked on that, my little brother, never. So do you feel like that, like, over the years, like, things are changing and, like, can you not go to Um, I, I think you're correct, I think when, earlier when I was talking about how the times have changed, from, like, when I came, there was, like, no Punjabis, and then now in, in Kern County, in Bakersfield especially, I know we jokingly call Southwest Bakersfield, Surrey, but I can say that on Punjabi, but he's, he's referring to, there's so many Punjabis, like we see BBs and Bakunis, which are like our elders walking every day, going to the parks. So his point of, he had it tough, but it's easier for his younger brother, um, that's, that's beautiful. And it's because there's more representation and the kids are feeling more comfortable wearing the dastas, you know, the turban. And um, so absolutely, it's getting better because the population's growing and you're seeing Punjabis in more spaces that they weren't in before. That makes a big difference too. We're learning about each other. Like this event today is mind blowing to me that we're really having this event. Um, but I think he's correct. His point is it's getting better. We're learning about each other. I'm surprised that this room is full of people who want to listen. I think it's beautiful. Absolutely, I think it's actually beautiful because I remember coming to Cal State and, yeah, no, even when we saw Punjabi, we ignored each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, fast forward to today, it's beautiful. I see all you young men back there with your thoughts on. You guys are proud of being Punjabi. Um, I, I, my kids go with me to like Doljeet concerts, which is like a big deal for us, like sold out crypto arena, things that would have never happened. So I do think now, because of the internet, you do see more connection across different countries, through music, through arts. So it's a beautiful time, and I think it's important that we keep embracing it. I want to add to that um, point, which is so important, and thank you for your question. It's, uh, for me, it was very important to see people that look like me in positions that, or in places that I didn't think that 
my community could be in. It's studying history. It's being the first a sick elected official. It's studying Sikhi at a PhD level, which I think if I shared that with my nanny or, you know, she would be very surprised that at, in, at an American university, in so much of our community, that this is possible. Like, you can study your own history, your own culture, and earn a degree in it. And, and those kind of programs, or, or exploring your own kind of path and, and doing something so unique, and I'm so excited to see what comes from that, and, and what has come from that, and what comes from seeing representation um, at, at, a, at a CSU level, at a statewide level, where we uh, can, where we can approach with like, hey, this has been missing for so long, we don't even know where to search for the answers, because we've just never been in those spaces to be able to ask the questions um, that we can ask today. Um, but, you know, the, you're right, you know, it, we see each other, um, and we see each other often, and I think that helps us feel a sense of belonging. And I'm sure everyone in the room or folks in the room have a, a sick neighbor or a Punjabi neighbor. And I hope you learned just a little bit more about your neighbor today. You know, you got to know your neighbor or you got to know some of your neighbors that are in this room today. Um, but at a community level and an inner community lover level, I would say that our challenges have shifted. They're different. They might, might not be like outwardly facing racism. Uh, but they're actually, what I would say, there's a new wave of generation that, um, of immigrants, we, we, we kind of learned a little bit about the different waves of migration that, that brought Sikhs and Punjabis to California. You know, my dad's reason was different than um, someone who, uh, you know, that I lovingly call like my, my truck driver, we who are, who are working hard, um, who are seeking asylum, who are seeking political refuge in places like Baker, so they're working long hours, um, they're, you know, they're immigration insecure. Those are realities, those are different realities um, that, are, that are being faced, but, you know, I feel that the, the challenges that are brought forward at a community level, and I get to hear about kind of all of them, <laughs> because we still need more people, we still need more help, we still need to build more capacity in our institutions. Um, to be able to address some of the, the newer challenges. Um, but you're right, I, I think it is something so beautiful just to end is that uh, we, we feel that sense of longing with one another and also in, in the places that we call home. This is your place, this is your home, and everyone should feel home in this place, sharing their authentic self. So thank you so much. I'm glad Dr. Harper wanted the mic because I was like, gotta cut this off. I, <laughs> I appreciate your comments, I appreciate your being here. If you would stay put uh, for just a couple of minutes, our archivist. Chris Livingston is going to say just a couple of words here about the archival collection at CSUB, particularly the desire to expand it and to include and expand holdings about the sick community. So let me say a couple of words, Chris. Thank you. What a great uh, program, great panel. Um, so thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you to the community. Um, just a few words, since 2014, the Historical Research Center has endeavored to preserve the region's history, especially as it relates to migration, our various cultures here, and of course, social justice issues. Um, but, you know, it's very important, I just want to you know, stress that it's important that we strive to document all voices in our community, and that's what our, the heart of our mission is in the HRC. Um, Raji, you mentioned that, um, you know, the importance of getting the history right. And I firmly believe that um, these histories begin with you. Um, you are your own archive. And uh, it's important that we transfer those histories into, into 
our social memory through uh, archival uh, preservation. Uh, and through that, um, we, are, we are working, and really started with Monique, uh, I have to say Monique was a student of mine in two of my classes, <laughs> and is one of our uh, very bright students um, that we have here at CSUB. And um, we are working to preserve the history of uh, six in the community. And, um, but it's gotta be a community effort. Um, and so, I, you know, I've, I've had conversations with Mempri over the years, I've, over the last few years, I think, on how we go about doing that. And I uh, just wanna, uh, you know, let you all know that we are here as a resource for the city community to help uh, establish community archives, but also uh, to collect materials as well. So um, we can do that through digitization of materials, uh, you don't have to give up your, your items, you know, um, there's various ways that we can accomplish that. So, um, this is uh, a long-term effort, um, you know, history begins today, um, and we should be documenting um, as, as we move forward. So, uh, and with that, I thank you for your attention. history, culture, religion that I did not know, which is one of the reasons we wanted to have this program. Um, thank you all for coming, and I hope that you all keep your ears and eyes out for future Public History Institute programs. Good night.